Hi everyone, this lesson is on a genetic condition that affects the urea cycle, and it is known as ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, or OTC. So we're going to talk about this condition and the urea cycle, and it will help us learn about the urea cycle as well. So OTC, or ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, is an X-linked recessive condition, meaning that in males, we only need to have one X chromosome affected, that will be enough to have this condition. In females, we'll have to have both X chromosomes affected, so that's why it's X-linked recessive. And it's going to be a condition involving elevated levels of ammonia. We'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about some of the pathophysiology and some of the signs and symptoms later. Now, this condition is due to a mutation in the OTC gene. And it is the most common disorder of the urea cycle, and it affects 1 in 56,000 individuals. So although it is going to be a more rare condition, because it is the most common disorder of the urea cycle, it's important to learn about. And we mentioned before that it is X-linked recessive. That's going to differ compared to other types of urea cycle disorders, where they are autosomal recessive conditions. So that's going to be an important point to make note of here. There are going to be two forms of OTC deficiency. There's a severe neonatal onset form. This is mostly going to affect male patients who are what we would call hemizygotes. So they just have that one affected X chromosome. This particular form is going to have an onset of symptoms within the first few days of life. And the second form is going to be a late onset form. It can occur a little later on in childhood, for instance, and this can occur in both males and females. Now let's talk about the urea cycle to better understand some of the pathophysiology behind what's going on in OTC deficiency. So in this diagram here, we're going to look at the urea cycle and we're looking at it in a hepatocyte, which is a liver cell. And we're going to need to know that parts of the cycle are going to occur in the mitochondria and parts of it are going to occur in the cytosol of that liver cell. So what's going to happen at first is that when we are metabolizing or processing amino acids, there's going to be a leftover waste. There's going to be ammonia formed. That ammonium is going to enter into the mitochondria in that liver cell. And along with CO2, these both are going to combine by the enzyme carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 or CPS1 utilizing 2 ATP and it's going to form carbamyl phosphate. So again, this is still occurring in the mitochondria. Once we have that carbamyl phosphate, then we're going to use ornithine that is coming from the urea cycle outside of the mitochondria. It's something inside the cytosol. And we're going to combine both carbamyl phosphate and ornithine by the enzyme OTC or ornithine transcarbamylase, and that's going to form citrulline. And then the citrulline is going to combine with aspartate using the enzyme arginino-succinate synthetase to form arginino-succinate. Then arginino-succinate is going to be acted on by the enzyme arginino-succinase, or also known as arginino-succinate lyase. That's going to form arginine and also a byproduct fumarate. And then arginine is going to be acted on by the enzyme arginase to form urea. This is the completion of the urea cycle. And then that urea is essentially removed from the arginine to regenerate that ornithine we started out with. And important point to make note of here is that this arginase enzyme is only going to be present in certain parts of the body. And one of those is hepatocytes. And we can also see it to a smaller degree in the kidneys as well. So that is going to be the urea cycle. And the problem is that as mentioned before, this OTC enzyme is going to be very important in the urea cycle. So because there is some issue with its functioning in OTC deficiency, we're going to have issues with this cycle. That's going to lead to particular effects inside the cell. These include the following. Increased carbamyl phosphate because we're not able to get rid of the carbamyl phosphate that is generated by CPS1. We're not able to utilize it with the OTC enzyme. So that's going to lead to a buildup or a backing up of carbamyl phosphate. And that higher level of carbamyl phosphate is going to lead to a backing up or a buildup of prior precursors, including ammonia. So that's going to be the reason why we can have higher levels of ammonia, as we mentioned earlier on in this lesson. And another important point to make note of here is that this high level of carbamyl phosphate can then be 
process into something called erotic acid. So that's going to be an important point to make note of when we talk about some of the diagnosis of this condition later. So we're going to have high levels of ammonia, higher levels of carbon monoxide, higher levels of erotic acid, and we can also have higher levels of ornithine, and we can also have lower levels of citrulline because again, this OTC enzyme is not functionable, so we're not able to convert ornithine with carbon monoxide into citrulline. So this is also something that can be found in these patients as well. And if you think this is very difficult to remember the steps of the urea cycle, we can use this mnemonic. Ordinarily, careless crappers are also frivolous about urinating. This can help us remember some of the steps or the ordering of some of these generated intermediates. So ordinarily, we can think of ornithine, carbon monoxide for careless, citrulline for crappers, R for aspartate, also for arginosuccinate, frivolous for fumarate, about for arginine and urinating for urea. So ordinarily, careless crappers are also frivolous about urinating is a way to remember some of the staging or the steps of the urea cycle. Now that leads us into some more systemic effects of this higher level of ammonia. So we get hyperammonemia, which is a high level of ammonia in the blood. Now you might be wondering, what does this do? So we have to kind of take a step back and look at a pathway that's important in producing certain neurotransmitters or those chemical signalers in the brain. So we start with alpha-ketoglutarate. And alpha-ketoglutarate is going to utilize an ammonia to form glutamate. Glutamate can then be processed into an important inhibitory neurotransmitter known as GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid. But glutamate can take another step utilizing another ammonia molecule to form glutamine, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So if we have too high of a level of ammonia or hyperammonemia, what can happen is we are going to have too much ammonia for these particular enzymatic steps. What can often happen is we can have a depletion of the alpha ketoglutarate because there's so much ammonia, ammonia starts to combine with more and more of the alpha ketoglutarate to form more glutamate. So we essentially consume our alpha ketoglutarate. The glutamate that is formed at higher levels can now be shunted into forming more GABA or gamma immunoperturic acid, that very important primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. And also this next step of this particular pathway also utilizes ammonia. So if we have too much ammonia here as well, we can essentially push this reaction toward more glutamine. And having more glutamine can lead to cerebral edema, so a swelling in the brain. This is the reason why we can have certain issues with having too much ammonia. Now, the classic story of this particular condition is going to be a young child that has a high protein intake. They have episodes of hyperammonemia, so high levels of ammonia in the blood, and then they have signs and symptoms. And they often will come in with poor feeding because of it. Now, as mentioned before, there are two forms. Oftentimes, we're going to see the more severe form earlier on, so in the first few days of life. So we start to see signs and symptoms, including slurred speech, somnolence, so being excessively fatigued and tired, tachypnea and hyperpnea. Tachypnea is going to be a fast rate of breathing. Hyperpnea is going to be deep breaths. Lethargy is also going to be important as well, so can, patients can be very, very sluggish. There can be some disorientation. There can also be nausea and vomiting as well. That's going to be important to recognize. They can have anorexia or a decreased appetite. Irritability and aggressiveness is going to be important in young infants or children. Blurred vision. Asterixis. Now, asterixis is going to be this flapping hand tremor. This is going to be a classic symptom of hyperammonemia in other conditions like cirrhosis, for instance. But we're often not going to see asterixis occurring in OTC deficiencies. It's going to be more of a rare finding. And some other very severe issues that can occur include seizures, obtundation, so they're just essentially unresponsive, and comas can occur in some patients as well. Now, let's talk about the diagnosis of this condition. So there are some newborn screenings for this particular condition, and we can also do genetic testing as well, looking at the OTC gene directly. So some other findings we can see, especially on blood work and looking at 
the urine of these patients, we can see higher levels of erotic acid. We talked about this before. That carbon phosphate is going to be converted into erotic acid. We're going to have higher levels of it in the blood and urine. We're also going to have lower blood urea nitrogen, essentially because we're not really producing enough of that urea because the urea cycle is affected. If we were to also measure citrulline, it's going to be low as well. We talked about the fact that OTC is not functioning properly in this condition, so we're not able to convert carbon phosphate and ornithine into citrulline by OTC. And an important point to make note of with this condition is that there is no megaloblastic anemia. The reason I bring up megaloblastic anemia, which is going to be a anemia with a high MCV of over 100, so that would be macrocytic anemia, and megaloblastic means that if we were to look at the PMNs or the neutrophils, there are at least five or more lobes. So that is going to be megaloblastic anemia, but we're not going to see megaloblastic anemia in this condition. The reason I bring it up here is because erotic aciduria, which is an, another urea cycle condition, has megaloblastic anemia. So erotic aciduria is another urea cycle condition that is autosomal recessive that also has some of these findings, including high levels of erotic acid, but it does have megaloblastic anemia, whereas OTC deficiency does not. So that's going to be important to look for as well. Now let's talk about how clinicians treat this condition. So there's acute management. Some patients will come in after having a high protein meal, for instance, they can have high levels of ammonia. And what we have to do in those states is that we have to discontinue protein intake. We have to have adequate hydration for these patients. We often can do rehydration with dextrose containing fluid but we have to be very cautious with that. We don't want to utilize too much dextrose as well because this can lead to hyperglycemia and some other issues as well. We also treat that hyperammonemia directly. We can use benzoate or phenyl acetate or phenyl butyrate. And in some cases, hemodialysis can be used. And for more long-term management of these patients, we want to use a restricted protein diet. So again, as mentioned before, amino acid metabolism is going to lead to the production of ammonia. So amino acids come from proteins. We want to restrict protein intake, but because we're restricting protein intake, we want to make sure we are supplementing patients with essential amino acids. That's going to be important. And in order to supplement the loss of calorie intake from the reduced protein intake, we can increase some other macronutrients, including carbohydrates. So we can slightly increase carbohydrates, for instance, to make up for that loss of calories from protein intake, for instance. So again, that is going to be more for long-term management. We want to try to reduce the amount of protein intake, but we also want to make sure that they're getting enough essential amino acids. If you want more information on the urea cycle, please check out my full lesson on the urea cycle. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.